Hello, hello from Know How to Wow, episode 45. Woo! Are we ready? Um, uh, Shuko, are, are we ready? Are you there? Where is Shuko? Uh, let me let me give her a quick call. Hi, you've reached Shuko. I'm busy right now, but if you want to leave me a message, dial one. Um, uh, huh, okay, I think it went to her voicemail. Hey, wait, <laughs> that's not a one, that's a five. Uh, Shuko, did you just, <laughs> seriously, did you just fake your own voicemail announcement? Melina, it's the morning. To get my day started, <laughs> I need to tease you a tiny bit. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> but how, how did you know I dialed five? Okay, that's pretty simple. You can hear it. So wait, um, I'm pressing now one and five. See? Oh. I have perfect pitch, at least when it comes to dial tones. Okay, not bad. This episode will indeed be about analyzing frequencies. Light frequencies. And how you can use them to analyze gas mixtures. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. I'm so glad you're here, starting my day with you and our dear listeners, of course. Let's get this show started. Yes. So, Melina, do you usually read the information on the packaging of foods that you buy? Uh, you mean the um, ingredient list or nutritional values? Either or, yeah. Um. Oh, well, it depends, to be honest. I mean, I'm having a toddler at home, so... I mean, when sharing food with him or... Well, with regards to what he eats, I definitely take a look at the amounts of sugar or sodium, mm -hmm. for example, but mm -hmm. not all the time, honestly. <laughs> what about you? Um, it'll depend on what kind of phase I'm in as well. So at <laughs> the moment, for example, I'm doing Lent and I am kind of looking at reducing the intake of sugar. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, I'm very much looking on the back of the foods, um, but usually I don't really... <laughs> Same here. Um, but nonetheless, to many people, it matters what they put in their body. And to make a great transition to our topic, it matters how much energy the food contains. Mm, so calories. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. <laughs> And the same is true for stuff that fuels not our bodies, but our gas boilers, for instance. So when you get your utility bill, you want to be sure that the company bills you for the energy correctly. If you heat your home with natural gas, for example, you want to be sure that you get a gas mixture with a certain caloric value. And typically it's about 90% methane that flows through those pipes. And the rest is a number of other gases that carry more or less energy than methane. Well, that is a pretty great comparison. I hadn't thought about it that way, but it makes sense, yeah. The problem is what's in a gas mixture has been really difficult to measure, but... As you've guessed, that's no longer the case. Da 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 da! Innovative Bosch <laughs> product enters the stage. <laughs> Our coworker Alex Stratmann has been developing a device that can tell you precisely what's in a certain gas, and his team gave it the name OGS. The OGS. It's an optical gas spectrometer. O M G. <laughs> <laughs> oh, GS. All right. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll get into what exactly an optical gas spectrometer is later. Mm -hmm. But first, what can it do? So in a nutshell, it solves the problem of measuring the components of gas mixtures and their concentration. So it can measure this gas, as well as this gas, and also this gas. Don't worry, dear listeners, um, no gas has been escaping while recording this episode. <laughs> But you know that from us, we like to make the things we talk about here audible for you. So in essence, <laughs> I mean, this goes back to your question, Melina. What is the OGS? It's a multi-gas sensor. But it's not like gas sensors haven't existed before, right? I have one right here in, in my office at home. It's a carbon monoxide detector and there's a smoke detector too. Yeah, of course. And you might have a lambda sensor in your car as well. By the way, another great Bosch invention, but that can only measure oxygen. Right. The lambda sensor measures oxygen in a car's exhaust. So all of these sensors can only measure particular gases at a particular concentration. And another example is hydrogen measurement. But measuring hydrogen is very complicated. 
Sensors are mostly focused on the level of concentration where hydrogen can become dangerous in the environment. We have special sensors who can measure maybe around 4% because it's a limit before it um, gets explosive. You will not find something which can measure small amounts of hydrogen and 100% hydrogen about the full range. Mm, okay, that is that is interesting. I mean, it makes sense that in some use cases, you just want to know if the concentration is above or below a certain threshold. Of course, you'd build a sensor centered around that threshold. Right. But measuring the full range of possible concentrations is more than just nice to have. Part of the transition to green energy is replacing natural gas with hydrogen. But the switch um, might be gradual, so you don't go from 100% natural gas to 100% hydrogen. And depending on the use case, it's going to be a mixture of both at first. If you enrich natural gas with hydrogen, you want to know it if it is 1%, 5%, 35%, 90%. So going back to our chat about uh, nutritional values and calories, you kind of want to know how many calories are in the gas that you're buying and burning. Mm -hmm, to, to figure out how much energy I can get out of it. Yes, because that's what you're really paying for. Mm -hmm. So what you're interested in is the energy and not the amount of cubic meters of gas. So would that problem go away once we switch to 100% hydrogen? Milena, we can always count on you for the good question. So <laughs> there are, of course, <laughs> use cases where you can't work with a mixture of methane and hydrogen, where you will need 100% hydrogen. But then the question becomes... Is it really 100%? Um, you know, if I fuel up my future car with hydrogen, do I get pure hydrogen at the filling station or not? What is its purity? If you buy hydrogen, you want to know the purity. Yeah, I guess I do. We've talked about different types of fuel cells on this show before. Mm -hmm. And from that, I know that they need absolutely pure hydrogen because otherwise they could get seriously damaged. Exactly. And if there's sulfur in there, for instance, that would be really bad. So the hydrogen gas has to adhere to a certain quality standard. The higher quality hydrogen, we are talking about 99.97 purity. So 300 ppm impurities. ppm meaning parts per million, by the way. If you have 1 million molecules, basically, only 300 can be something that's not hydrogen. What could those impurities be, for example? And where do they come from? They come from the process of making hydrogen. Today, hydrogen mostly comes from natural gas. So there it is again. Natural gas, or as we called it, methane. There's a chemical process called reforming, which can be used to turn methane into hydrogen. This is the cheapest and most common way to produce hydrogen at least for the time being, until we have enough green energy and electrolyzers available. Short ed break. If you're wondering, listeners, what are electrolyzers, what is green hydrogen, tell me more. We've got you covered, of course. We made a whole episode about it. So check out our episode called How to Produce Green Hydrogen at Scale. You'll find the link in the show notes. I always love when we can look back at episodes we've done yeah. in the past and say, hey, uh, so I definitely recommend hey, it. we've talked about that before. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but while electrolysis is cool, for now, most hydrogen is made the old-fashioned way, so out of methane. So if you take it out from natural gas, then you have the main impurity is uh, methane because it's the main component. But green hydrogen would solve that problem, wouldn't it? So no more methane contamination when you don't make hydrogen from natural gas. Yeah, sure, but impurities can still happen. If you then have clear hydrogen and put it, let's say, in a filling station for hydrogen cars, then you have sometimes cleaning or flushing processes in this filling station. This cleaning and flushing will be done with nitrogen when you have nitrogen impurities. Or, you know, maybe there's a leak somewhere. That can also always happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. So what did Alex say? In a typical use case, 300 ppm parts per million of impurities are acceptable. How can he help with this? 
Well, as he mentioned earlier, measuring hydrogen is super complicated. And the OGS changes that. Plus, the OGS can also find those 300 needles in the hydrogen haystack, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And one goal for our OGS, because we can measure hydrogen in an easy way, is to measure the impurities. And the impurities of 300 ppm or 100 ppm we can measure. So basically, the OGS can give you that um, ingredient list, like the ones we appreciate on food packagings. Mm-hmm. Next time I buy a bottle of fresh hydrogen, I'll ask the OGS if it may contain nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Um, and now to the how. So let's get to the topic of how the OGS works. The easy answer is it's all in the name, optical gas spectroscopy. It's a Raman spectrometer. Raman? Yeah, Raman. So we're talking about R-A-M-A-N, Raman. So let's talk about Raman spectroscopy from the beginning. Around 100 years ago, there was a person, Mr. Raman. There was an Indian physicist, and he made experimental setups and found this so-called Raman effect. He measure it with a complex setup because it has no technology at that time and detect this special light. I can explain later. Write it in the paper. And by the way, this paper is uh, only one page. Yeah? You can read it very easily. One year later, he gets a Nobel Prize for it. Yeah? So it's very easy. It seems to be, but it, it's not so easy. By the way, we even know when Raman exactly found this effect that's now named after him. On February 28th, 1928. Today, in his honor, February 28th is celebrated in India as National Science Day. Getting a Nobel Prize for one pager? <laughs> Props to that, not bad. Um, so can you tell us more about his discovery, the uh, special light that Alex mentioned? For now, let's say when you shine a light at molecules, that light gets scattered. And that scattered light has a frequency that is slightly different from the light that you shone on the molecule. This frequency shift is different for each molecule. And so if you can detect the shifted light frequency, you know which molecule is responsible for it. So Rama needed a one-pager for that. Shuko, props <laughs> to you. That explainer was a Nobel Prize worthy 30 seconds. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. <laughs> I myself looked into Raman spectroscopy a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. And what I found out is that it is a pretty common technology nowadays in some places. In the art world, for instance. I'm really glad that you make that a connection because it's much easier to use when it comes to liquids or solids. The challenge is analyzing gases with it. True. Nevertheless, it's super interesting how it can help cracking some mysteries and even police investigations. Sometimes we really cooperate with the police. This is Christina Aibeo. Of course, it's very exciting when, I mean, there was already a very strong hint that the paintings were fake. She uses Raman spectroscopy to uncover forgeries. When you identify pigment, and the Raman is very important there. Identified pigment, which is anachronist, and the pigment is too modern to this painting, and you can therefore prove that the painting is not, it's not that old as it is supposed to be, and therefore a forgery, because it was sold as a painting from that period. Of course, that's very exciting. Christina is a chemist and conservation scientist at the Rathgen Research Laboratory of the National Museum in Berlin. It sounds like she uses Raman spectroscopy to identify the ingredients of artworks, the pigments an artist used. Precisely. Her Raman spectrometer is integrated into a microscope, so she can zoom in on one tiny spot of a painting and then create an analysis. Of course, we always try to do non-invasive, non-destructive analysis. Non-invasive means you don't need a sample and invasive means you need to take a sample and non-destructive means you don't destroy your sample because with some techniques you have to dissolve your sample or burn or whatever. So Raman can be non-destructive and non-invasive because it's a microscope it's also easy to put an object under it 
So if the object is very big, in the case of our instrument, it's normally uh, required to take a sample. But even then, the sample can be so small, you can barely see it with the naked eye. And she does this just to identify forgeries? Or is there more to it? Much more. <laughs> Christina's work is also important to art historians who want to know which painter used which pigments, or vice versa. When it's unclear who painted something, the information about pigments can help attribute a painting to a painter. But not just that. Christina might help decide what you can see in a museum and what remains locked away in an archive. If a museum decides to make an exhibition, for example, and it knows that there's some pigments which are very sensible to light, they might ask us, so can you look if these pigments are present? So we will do a very short exhibition or the same for drawings. I mean, some inks are more sensitive than others. So often we might be asked, and what, what is the kind of ink used here? Because some are not to be very sensitive to change color, so they are not allowed to be exhibited or very short. Sometimes I'm just so blown away by what people do for a living. That is so cool. It's and so different to what we do. But now I'm more interested <laughs> in when are we having an exhibition about all of these secret art projects or art that cannot be <laughs> exhibited? I love these kind of like behind the door stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask her. Christina knows. And it, it's getting even cooler because right now she's busy with a project related to climate change. There are many projects running in my laboratory at the moment trying to find out how museums can be more environmental friendly. Yes, Raman can help there too. Christina wants to learn more about what actually causes degradation of artworks. Temperature fluctuations and humidity fluctuations and light, they all can cause degradation of certain objects. But we think it's very important to know exactly how and not to be so strict to say you have to keep the temperature by 22 plus minus one and the humidity by 55 plus minus three. That's very strict. That costs a lot of energy. I mean, if you set this very strict parameters, your air conditioning or your heating system will be on all the time. Okay. So Maybe Raman spectroscopy could reveal that actually a little higher temperature, a little more humidity doesn't accelerate degradation that much. Right. And then it won't be that chilly in museums anymore. And it would save a ton of energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So over the past two decades or so, Raman spectroscopy has had an increasing impact on the art world. And it continues to reveal new secrets all the time. So while Raman spectroscopy is pretty common technology in some fields, for analyzing gases, it hasn't really been very practical. The signal is very weak. It's very, very, very weak. So as Alexander is saying, it's very, very, very weak. <laughs> <laughs> And the Raman effect is actually so small, only so little of the light is affected by it. And that is really hard to measure. And what happens when scientists want to measure something really small? They build a giant apparatus, right? <laughs> <laughs> Bingo. So you have some scientists with a big setup, you know, and they're preparing the gas samples and the laser and the detector. And we're talking about costs of 200,000 euro or more. And then you can measure gases. Alex gathered his first experiences with Raman spectroscopy in such a lab himself as a physicist at a university. He says it can take a scientist one day to complete one measurement, only one. So as you can imagine, it's not really practical for everyday use. For industrial application, we need a small box, power on, gas in a measurement. And that's what we have done. We have reduced this big lab setup in this small shoebox size uh, setup that you can measure now gases in a very easy way. Mm, and I suppose it's not just much smaller, it's also much faster. Exactly. Say you want to know how much nitrogen is in the air surrounding us. To measure air, 78% nitrogen in air is very complex and not so easy. We can measure it in 10 milliseconds. Wow. So if I put everything together correctly, A laser light shines on the gas molecules. Mm -hmm. The electrons of the molecules shift the light frequency a little bit. Yeah. And that 
gets measured. Correct. How, how exactly? Simply put, by a light sensor. A camera chip, basically. Similar to the one in your smartphone camera. Mm -hmm. The technical term is CCD. Charge coupled device. Mm -hmm. Charge coupled device. A CCD chip. Okay. But before the light hits the chip, it passes through some optics. That's the actual spectroscopic element. And what does that do? It basically splits the light by frequency. I, I've described that you get uh, your photons through the optics, yeah, so your camera bar, on your photo detector on the CCD camera bar. And you have it sorted by the frequency. That's what we call a spectrum. And if you look on this spectrum, you get different positions, different peaks, the so-called Raman lines. And these peaks at different positions comes from the different molecules. So example, hydrogen and air have at one position a peak and oxygen have at a different position a peak. So all you need to know is which molecule makes a peak in which position. Yes, if you want to know what molecules are present. Except it can get a bit more complex. For instance, one molecule can actually produce multiple peaks. And they can overlap with the peaks of other molecules. Let me explain. Um, remember when you called me at the beginning of our recording session? Yes, I was supposed to press one to leave a message. But you could tell I pressed five. Exactly. And I think those dial tones are actually a really good analogy here. Um, so let's say one represents oxygen and five represents nitrogen. Pretty easy to tell them apart, right? Yeah, pretty easy if you know what you're listening for. <laughs> then yes. Yeah, okay. If you know what you're listening for, right. But if you're pressing them at once, it gets a little trickier. So just like Alex does it with the light frequencies, you could split these sound frequencies apart to see what this sound consists of. And then you'd not see two, but four peaks. Because that's how dial tones work. Each dial tone is made up to two frequencies. So our mix of one and five produces a spectrogram with peaks at 697 hertz and 1,209 hertz. Together, they make the one dial tone and 770 hertz and 1,336 hertz together produce the five dial tone. When I dial five, those frequencies get sent over the phone line and at the other end, some machine analyzes them and knows that I dialed five. Correct. And in our <laughs> okay. analogy, you dialed nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Five is nitrogen. So let's add something else to the mix. Air also has water in it, you know, humidity. So let's say the number seven represents H2O molecules. When we analyze all three of them together, oxygen, nitrogen, and water, so again, talking one, five, and seven, it gets really, really muddled. You'd probably expect six peaks now, you know, as we said before, two for each molecule. Yeah. But no, in this case, we actually have five peaks. Uh-huh. So can we not measure water for some reason? We can, but the thing is, mm -hmm. in this case, they overlap. So the seven produces peaks at 852 hertz and 1,209 hertz. And those 1,209 hertz we've heard before as a component of the one dial tone, if you remember. Any number we add to the mix would partially overlap with some other number. And that is exactly what makes it difficult to tell them apart. Wowie, that's probably why we still have to dial one number after the other and we can dial two <laughs> digits at once. But when you analyze a gas mixture with the OGS, you can't first separate the molecules and then look at them one by one. So you're getting the spectrum with all the overlapping peaks from all the molecules all at once. If you have some impurities, for example, in hydrogen, or if you look on natural gas or on biogas, then you have maybe 10 or 15 or 20 components inside. And then you have a mix of different lines, more or less overlapping. So there has to be some way to figure out what's the makeup of these lines. And that way is algorithms. An algorithm that knows 
exactly what each molecule looks like in the spectrum individually, and then finds the molecules that, when ended up, result in the measured spectrum. But not only which molecules, but also how many of them. Right, because you want to know how much nitrogen is in the air or how many impurities are in my hydrogen. The higher the proportion of one molecule, one substance in the mix, the higher are its peaks, or the stronger are its Raman lines. This is the advantage of Raman spectroscopy in comparison to other detectors or other sensors. The signal intensity is strong linear to the gas concentration. 1% you get the peak height of, let's say, one. And if you have a double, you have doubling concentration. That at least should make the math a little easier. It definitely does. And also calibration of the OGS is pretty straightforward because of this. There is no complex curve that describes the relationship between the intensity of the measured signal and the concentration of the gas molecules. It's purely and simply linear, and that's the same for any type of molecule that the OGS can measure. So you're saying there are gases it can't measure? Yein. <laughs> Or, well, it's basically two things. One, there are a lot, I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot of gases. And for most of them, it's unknown what the Raman spectrum actually looks like. But it's not like it can't be figured out. So that was one. And two, there are some pretty pesky gases that just don't want to be measured at all. Noble gases, helium, neon, argon, have no Raman, so you cannot measure noble gases. But all other molecules have one or more lines. Really? <laughs> You're basically telling me they are too noble to be measured. Gases can also be divas, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> aside from these limitations, the gas mixtures can also, I mean, you... Complex is our word of the podcast somehow, and these gas mixtures can get as complex as it gets. We are working on the measurement of the composition of natural gas. And there we are talking about 13 components. 13 different components from 100 ppm to nearby 100% in different mixture compositions. So it's as if I'm pressing 13 keys on my phone at once. And if there were an OGS for dial tones, it could tell them apart. That is pretty awesome. So thanks to OGS, the composition of gas mixtures is no longer a secret. And it could even say how hard I'm pressing the keys, representing the concentrations. Yes, exactly as you said, you can measure them anywhere, anytime, and within seconds using a device that is portable. We call it the tabletop system, yeah? You can Put it there where you want to measure, switch on, put in the gas. We have uh, gas in, gas out, power connection, and you can start uh, directly measurement and see the data on your computer. When Alexander says that, it sounds so easy. <laughs> It's fantastic. So hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, methane, and many more. OGS detects them and builds an ingredient list for gas mixtures. Who knew this was so tricky to accomplish and hasn't really been possible on a large scale? Indeed. And it's so important, as we discussed, for the green energy transition, but also for a lot of applications outside of that. Shuko, that was a complicated one. So thank you so much for these insights. You're very welcome. Our colleagues really helped. Props to you. Thomas, you yeah, did a um, great Steph, job. Once you've <laughs> Uh, you will soon be able to buy your bottle of fresh hydrogen without worrying about impurities, Menina. So you and your family can enjoy all of this. <laughs> <laughs> Our fresh bottle of hydrogen. <laughs> Just what I wanted. Talk to you soon. Bye and listeners, stay tuned for the deep dive with more about the OGS. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. How do you condense a big lab setup into a small tabletop device? I'm Jeff's voice avatar, and I have more insights from Alex to share. For instance, about the nitty-gritty of measuring hydrogen at a filling station. 